Today's sermon text is from John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16a. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, He who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Let us bow our heads in humility before this king. God, would you reveal to us how Jesus is the king over all of heaven and earth. All authority belongs to him. Show us, God, where we are still in rebellion to him and help us to humble ourselves in submission to him, begging for mercy, knowing that he is merciful. That he went through this very moment in history to obtain that mercy for us. That we could be washed by his blood and made new by his resurrection. Would you give us that faith by the power of your spirit who is present with us today because of the name of King Jesus. Amen. In the TV show called Undercover Boss, a high-level executive of a company puts on a disguise and then inserts himself into his business as an entry-level employee to work alongside them. And none of them really have any idea what's going on, who he really is. And it leads him to many insightful moments, sometimes finding out that the working conditions for his employees are really difficult and he sympathizes with them. Other times, he finds some of his employees, particularly arrogant middle managers, they are quite terrible to the labor. They're high on their small authority, utterly disrespectful to customers. And they have no idea that their boss is present with them right there, 
Sometimes they even treat him poorly. But he's not personally hurt by all of this. He knows who he is, even though his authority is, and identity is veiled. But he sees all of this ridiculous behavior and this discouraged labor force, and it encourages him to work, to move on behalf of his employees. He reveals his identity and cleans house. Throughout this scene that Scott read for us in these final moments of Jesus' life before his death, he is like an undercover boss. On the surface, it looks like the main characters are Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and the chief priests, Annas and Caiaphas, both of these representing the ruling class of the Roman Empire and the Jewish religious establishment. He's highlighting for us this power struggle between two authorities. And trapped in the middle of it all appears this weak Jesus. Seems like just a common man caught up in the crossfire of a political power struggle. He appears like he's a, a passive victim in, a, in it all. He only speaks one time. He only goes where the other people drag him around to go. He's mocked by the authoritarian self-importance of the Roman soldiers. But at the same time, if you look closer, you realize he's actually the boss. He's in complete control. Everything is happening exactly how he had always planned to accomplish his kingdom purposes. Jake taught us last week from the sermon at the end of chapter 18 that Jesus is the king of the kingdom of truth. And now John shows us through this corrupt trial that Jesus reigns in truth through apparent weakness. In his life and even now through his church, Jesus reigns through apparent weakness. The story unfolds with a lot of subtle imagery, irony. On the surface, it looks like, from one perspective, like it's going one way, but beneath it all, exactly the opposite thing is happening. In each phase, Jesus appears like he's helpless, but in reality, he's the sovereign king fulfilling all of God's purposes. So we're going to look at this pattern, this irony in four parts today. First, in verses 1 through 5, we see Jesus as the righteous branch sprouting. When it looks like he's beaten down, he's actually sprouting up new life. In verses 6 through 8, we witness the holy law fulfilling as the chief priests try to use the law to put Jesus down. Instead, he is fulfilling the law which will condemn them under it. And verses 9 through 11 then show us the silent lamb reigning. Here, Pilate looks to be in control, but Jesus asserts his own authority here over all things. And finally, in verses 12 to 15, Jesus is put on his throne as the sovereign king judging. Pilate moves to his judgment seat to condemn Jesus, but our Savior now displays perfect judgment himself, exposing the corruption all around him. So fascinating how this whole story is put together, knit together by God to show us that this word is true. Jesus is Lord, and all who believe in him have life in his name. So let's dive into this thrilling scene in the first five verses we see Jesus as a righteous branch sprouting follow along again then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe they came up to him saying hail king of the Jews and they struck him with their hands Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, 
Behold the man. This scene follows some interaction with Pilate already at the end of chapter 18, where the Roman governor has already determined that he sees no guilt in Jesus. He wanted to release Jesus, but the Jews at the, at the end of 18 demanded that they release Barabbas, an actual criminal, instead. And Pilate is stunned by this request. Why? What's so harmful about Jesus? He's no threat. You want Barabbas? He's actually condemned for hurting people? And so he decides he's going to show how little of a threat Jesus actually is. He takes Jesus out back to the woodshed, roughs him up a little bit, puts him in his place, and then what in his weakened state, puts a robe, purple robe on him, a crown of thorns, just to show he's no king. Look, it's obvious. Caesar would normally wear a crown that was full of life and had flowers and leaves on it, symbolizing how his rule, his authority brings life to the empire. But Jesus, this crown of thorns, look how lifeless his authority is. The Roman soldiers mock him, hit him in the face, showing that they have power over him. They, they say, hail, king of the Jews, paralleling what they would normally say to Caesar, Ave, Caesar, and praise him. The point of all of this is to bring Jesus, all humiliated, before all of the Jews and try to stir up some pity for the man. If they saw how weak and pathetic he was, maybe they would give up this fervor, this foolishness trying to kill him. So Pilate stands Jesus up before them in verse 5 in all of his pathetic regalia, and he says, Behold the man. Look, he's no threat. He's just a weak man. Can we be done with this? But this scene is much more than it seems. Ironically, Pilate is actually helping Jesus fulfill prophecy from Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 6, he has this vision that God wants to give to the exiles in Babylon. They've been beaten. They've been taken from their homes. They've been weakened. They feel lost, and God's promises are falling apart. And God gives him this vision, sends four chariots north, south, east, west, to show that God is in control of all the earth. To encourage them, even in their weakness, God is reigning. And he wants them to trust him and display their trust in him by, he says, grab a hold of this ordinary man from among you. His name is Joshua, which in Hebrew is the same name as Jesus. And stand him up in front of everybody and dress him up like a king and say to the people, behold, the man who is the branch reminding them of prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah that amidst all the rubble of their lives, the ruin of their nation, one day God is going to sprout a new life out of that darkness, who's going to be the priest king to sit on the throne forever and rule in peace with his people. Now, obviously, Pilate doesn't realize any of this, He just thinks he's being clever to try to put the Jews in their place. But even so, he's still an instrument in God's hand. He's the mouthpiece of God's decrees. But the Jews are enraged. Perhaps they recognize this messianic prophecy unknowingly coming out of Pilate's mouth, and it triggers them. Maybe they think Jesus put him up to saying that, and if that's the case, he's got to go. Out with Jesus. So we see in verses 6 through 8, this story continuing to progress with these two different perspectives now in the holy law fulfilling. The Jews think they're fulfilling the law in one way, but Jesus is fulfilling the law in a completely different way. So let's read those again, 6 through 8. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. 
And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. So when the, the chief priests here behold the man, it triggers this fever pitch of anger in them, and they just immediately burst out, crucify him. Pilate's mockery didn't work. He, he thought mocking them would quench the fire, but it was pouring gasoline on it. Everything he does seems to make it worse. So, of course, he's going to try to mock them further. He tells them, go crucify him yourselves. He knows they can't do that. That's against Roman law. They would be arrested for rebellion against Rome if they tried such a thing. So what Pilate's trying to do is really put them back in their place, saying, you don't have a voice here, reasserting his authority. He's found Jesus guilty of nothing worthy of death. So he's telling them, it's over, guys. Go home. We're not having this conversation anymore. But they're still not satisfied. Seems like they're willing to confront Rome over this. We have a law, they say, and he ought to die. The law they're referring to is from Leviticus 24, verse 16. It says, whoever blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall be put to death. On multiple occasions, Jesus has claimed authority as God's son. He's claimed authority over the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's claimed authority over the law. He's making himself like God, they think, and so he needs to die. They think they've got Jesus trapped. And it would be true if Jesus were merely a man, but he's not. He's the son of God in every way scripture speaks of it. Sometimes humanity or Israel is sp spoken of as the son of God. And Jesus is the perfect man or the pure Israel. Sometimes the phrase son of God meant referred to the person who was anointed the king over Israel. And Jesus is that too. The Psalms often spoke of the son of God as someone who has a nature like God, who's given eternal authority over all heaven and earth. And that, too, is Jesus. Yet, ironically, as the chief priests are making this claim of blasphemy, it's actually them who are breaking the law. Blasphemy means to profane God's holy name, to drag the eternal righteousness of his character through the mud, to claim that what God calls good is bad, to misrepresent God. So by bringing Jesus to trial and demanding crucifixion, they are committing blasphemy. By claiming to be priests as a mediator between God and man, yet cutting off their people's only access to God, they are committing blasphemy. By stating they speak on behalf of God's law, but breaking the law themselves, they are committing blasphemy. And soon they'll commit the ultimate blasphemy when they reject God as king over them and claim no king but Caesar. And for that, they ought to die. Ironic turn of events here. Again, but nobody realizes what's happening. They're all just striving to gain more control. Pilate watches the Jews get angry and it troubles him deeply because he realizes there's about to be a battle for control here. The priests are willing to kill to gain control. So Pilate retreats back into, into the, his office with Jesus, seeing if he can get himself out of this trouble. Not, not Jesus. He doesn't care about Jesus. He wants himself out of this trouble. So in verses 9 through 11, we see that turned upside down with our silent lamb reigning. He, Pilate, entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So, so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would not have authority 
you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. This is really the central theme of this scene. A showdown of powers now between Rome and heaven. Throughout this drama, Jesus has not said a word. He's just seemed like this helpless, passive pawn in, in a power struggle between Rome and Judea. But Pilate's, Pilate is curious. He seems like something otherworldly, something unknown is happening here, that he, and he can't grasp control of it. So he asks Jesus where he's from. Jesus has already claimed at the end of chapter 18 to be a king. Pilate initially scoffed at that. Okay, whatever you say. But now he realizes, oh, maybe he really is a king. Maybe he does have some hidden power and authority that's causing these Jews to be this mad. Where does he get this authority? What, what kingdom is this? Pilate's trying to figure out what is he really dealing with here? Who's the greater threat, Jesus or the priests? Where, where can he scheme and manipulate to put this situation down? Yet Jesus refuses to participate in Pilate's scheme. He just remains silent, as Isaiah foretold in chapter 53, verse 7. Isaiah wrote, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus doesn't need to win any arguments. He knows who he is. His true identity is veiled. He's not trying to win authority. He's striving to win souls by being the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But Pilate mistakes his silence for foolish weakness. And he threatens Jesus in verse 10. Don't you know that I have the power to release you? The authority to crucify you? Which is more than just simple chest puffing. He's admitting his corrupt authority. His decision will not be based on the truth of Jesus' guilt or innocence, but on his own sense of superior authority. This is what all rulers are who are not submitted to God. Either they're angry at him and reject him outright, as the chief priests do, or they ignore him and simply try to rule from this self-importance. They listen to the masses, of course, just to appease them so they can stay in power. But with all this corruption around him, Jesus still is not shaken. Jesus' only words in this entire scene are in verse 11. Though he has been silent, he is still the silent lamb reigning. He tells Pilate that Pilate's authority, whether he realizes it or not, is from God. God gave it to him, and God can quickly take it away, and he soon will. But more than that, Jesus is also answering the question of where he's from He's saying that he himself is the authority from above. That silent, passive prisoner is declaring himself as the heavenly authority over Pilate. The last time Jesus used these words, from above, was John chapter 3, that interaction with Nicodemus, saying you need to be born from above. And he says, whoever comes from above is above all. Whoever is, comes from above, from heaven, is above all, saying that's me. Jesus is the one from above with, heaven, with authority over heaven and earth, even if he looks to be weak. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 brings all of this imagery together, saying that Jesus is the lamb who was slain, yet standing at the throne of God, being worshipped by all spirits, spiritual beings and earthly beings. <coughs> Jesus reigns through his apparent weakness. He sees everything that's going on, and he will bring true justice. And he begins now to call out sin and warn of its coming judgment. Pilate, he says, is sinning, of course, in his corrupt rule over Judea, but there is still a greater sin. 
by the one who handed him over to Pilate. The chief priests, they're the ones committing the greater sin. Despite what people today want to say, some sins are worse than others. Pilate did sin for his political corruption that resulted in Jesus' death. But the chief priests had the greater sin with the amount of vile hatred and scheming to force Pilate's hand. And even worse, they will reject God as king over them, sealing their own judgment. This is the judgment that we see now in verses 12 to 16. And Jesus steps onto his throne as the sovereign king judging. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So Pilate is convinced of Jesus' innocence because of this one statement from Jesus about authority from above. He, he now believes it's best. Jesus has more power here. I better give him what he wants. It's best to set him free. Perhaps he suddenly felt God's righteous eyes gazing down upon him. Or we know from Matthew's account of this story that Pilate's wife had a dream where she said, we need to stay away from this Jesus guy. He's trouble. Whatever it was that Pilate was thinking, he just wanted the situation over and he thought it best to let Jesus go. But he's not escaping so easily. The chief priests, they may be wicked and invictive, but they're not stupid. They trap Pilate by appealing to Caesar, saying that if Pilate lets Jesus go, he's no friend of Caesar. That little phrase, friend of Caesar, is enough to send Pilate into a panic. To be a friend of Caesar was this political statement that Caesar could trust you in your position. And Pilate was already on very thin ice with Caesar. History records his leadership was not so great. There was a lot of suspicion about the Jews in, in Israel and that they might rise up. Caesar was always nervous about potential threats to his throne. Pilate had a benefactor, someone back in Rome who was rich, who provided for him to be able to survive down here in Judea. And even that benefactor once was caught scheming against Caesar. So all of these things together have Pilate in a pretty precarious position. So dropping this phrase was strategic. The chief priests suddenly trapped Pilate. They were pretending to be more loyal to Caesar than Pilate was. And that was enough to change his mind. If there's anything he wants more than a clean conscience, it's political power. It's still common today, right? And so he moves now to his judgment seat in verse 13 to declare his decision. The word for judgment seat here is bima. Maybe you've, ever, you've heard of a bima judgment before. It simply refers to a, a platform, a raised platform where an authority comes and makes his official decree that's to be carried out as law. Paul is going to use that same phrase, that same word in 2 Corinthians 5, Romans 14, to say the true beam of judgment seat belongs to Jesus. So though it appears that Pilate is on the judgment seat, God is standing right there with him in judgment over all of them. But first, he's going to take the judgment upon himself. John inserts 
kind of awkwardly, this parenthetical statement in verse 14, that all of this is occurring in the middle of the day on the day of the preparation for the Passover. Meaning that on the surface, the priests are trying to hurry this thing along because they need to get out and go slaughter some lambs for the Passover feast. But again, the irony is that they're in the process of slaughtering the true Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, in complete control of this whole circumstance, to accomplish salvation for his people, even though it looks like he is weak and helpless. He's still the king who judges. And so Pilate becomes the mouthpiece of God again, trying to show disdain for the Jews, says, behold, your king. He's trying to tell them that their authority is as pathetic as Jesus standing up here. But again, Pilate's words mean more than he understood. That simple statement, Jesus is the king, sends them into a fit of rage. It exposes the wickedness of the Jews. It uncovers the heart of their corruption. They respond, away with him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. There it is, exposed in all their wickedness, the ultimate blasphemy. They've rejected Yahweh as king over them and they bow down to Caesar, sealing their own judgment by rejecting the only one who can save them from it. And this is the sad reality of the world that we all live in. This is all of us. We commit blasphemy, all of us, every day in our lives. We're made to reflect God's beautiful image in this world, to tell the world what his character is like through our lives. And when we choose sin, we tarnish that image. We tell lies about his character. We reject his authority over us. This blasphemy deserves death. Most people then, realizing this, try to push him away, where the only solution is to get close to him and bow down in surrender and beg for mercy. And you can be certain that he is merciful because you see throughout this whole story him working as the undercover boss to obtain that mercy for you. He went like a silent lamb to the slaughter to take the judgment for your selfish, blasphemous life. He died to take that punishment and rose from the dead to give you a spirit-filled life full of faithful, joyful submission, obedience to his lordship. And so if you are in Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus, now he calls you to display and proclaim his authority, his reign through your weakness. That's what we see the disciples do in the book of Acts, following Jesus' example. That word bima is used more often in the book of Acts to show these experiences of the disciples, the apostles, putting themselves into situations where they are dealing with these political authorities and they are glad to proclaim there, Jesus is Lord. They trusted, as Paul said to the Corinthians and the Romans, the true judgment seat belongs to Jesus and that all who hurt them will be judged. This is what makes them bold to proclaim the gospel in the face of opposition. And it's the example for us to follow today. Jesus still reigns today through his apparently weak church, like us. But don't let our apparent weakness fool you. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against Christ's church. We are more than conquerors in the king who has overcome the world. So follow his example in the same way that he modeled for us. He says, just like he was unjustly treated, you too will face tribulation in order for him to show off his power and your weakness. Just as he was wrongly accused of unrighteousness, so will you if you trust that he died and rose from the dead to make you righteous. 
so that you can live faithfully in this world without a need to defend yourself. When they call you to account, they pull you before governors and kings, you can stay silent and let his holiness speak for you. Just as he opened his mouth to announce his heavenly authority, we must be always careful to use our lips to proclaim his authority in our lives and over all things, to call others in our lives to surrender to him who comes from above. And just as the proclamation of his reign exposed corruption, we too must be about reminding our world that Jesus will judge sin. And he has taken that judgment for those who trust in him. We were saved to represent that authority here on earth, to call a world to repentance and faith. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord and it exposes sin, great sin. And the beautiful thing about the country we live in is that we have much freedom to get involved and remind our nation that Christ is Lord over it. We must not be so naive to think that our political rulers, our, our corporate leaders are just people trying to do their best with the best intentions. There's no such thing as neutral authority. If they're not surrendered to Jesus, they're either like Pilate or the priests trying to manipulate control for their own glory. Jesus does command us to submit to authorities, certainly, but he also encourages us to be wise in how we do so. Submitting only in so far as they stay in the lane that God has given them. Not any further. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar means submit to Caesar in the things that God has given to Caesar. But don't submit to Caesar when Caesar claims more authority than that. That belongs to God. Christians have been killed throughout history for refusing to say Caesar is Lord. That, that lets Caesar think that they can have authority apart from God. No, Christians have always said, Jesus is Lord, and you are under his authority. They wouldn't try to scheme their way into influence, maybe try to be really nice, gain an audience, and then maybe people will respect me. No, Jesus is the king, offends people, and exposes sin and Christians have always done that, even if it meant mockery or death. They refuse to support the delusion that anyone can have authority apart from Christ. And we too must live such as faithful kingdom citizens. As uncomfortable as it is to talk about politics, you can't avoid talking about politics because to call yourself a Christian is to say that Jesus is Lord, which is a political statement. And so we are encouraged in every way possible to get involved in our world to say, Jesus is Lord. All authority belongs to him. And we get to go vote this year with those kingdom principles in mind. Some of us can run for local, state, federal offices and proclaim Jesus there. Most of us get to just proclaim Christ's authority by building faithful, hospitable, productive households for the name of Jesus. We represent his authority in our jobs when we say, I work for Jesus. Wherever God has placed us, we must call out and stand against sin, especially the greater sins that cause more offense to God and more harm to society. Some sins do assault his nature more and corrupt his mission more and hurt our neighbors more, both in the church and in the world. Pride and division in the church can disrupt, damage our witness much more than other sins. Or in our nation, so-called gay marriage or sexual liberation and no-fault divorce tarnish the image of God, his loving nature. It perverts his gracious gift of pleasure. It refuses to submit to his mandate to be fruitful and fill the earth with image bearers and subdue it so people can flourish in it. We have the authority of Jesus to say no. We do not do those things. It is harmful 
and offensive to God, and we warn our neighbors of Christ's coming judgment. So brothers and sisters, let's follow Jesus' example here and proclaim that even in our weakness. Live out your heavenly kingdom citizenship in Christ right here on earth. Even if you look weak and foolish doing it, we trust Jesus will sovereignly reign through our apparent weakness. Let's submit to him in prayer again. God, if there are any in this room who have not surrendered their life to Christ, I pray that you would expose their sin. You would help them turn from it, flee from it, and run to your mercy and find their open arms pierced by Roman nails, lifted up on the cross by a corrupt priesthood in order to give freedom from judgment and new eternal life in Christ. Help us as a church to live out that freedom for the glory of the name of King Jesus. Amen.